come to the service. Let's stand and pray. Father, we come to you in the beginning of the service again to thank you for your hands over us and your protection over us even during the night. So we know there were a lot of storms in the south. We pray that you would be with those people as they clean up and that they don't get discouraged to pray, especially for the Christians, Father, and those that have lost people, um, people that died. We just pray, Father, that you would be with them. But now also we thank you for your salvation to us. That's the reason we're here. We're here to simply celebrate what we believe and that which you've brought in our lives. And we thank you for that, Father. Thank you and praise you. And we lift up our voices today and we radiate into the heavens that which we know has happened in our lives, the victories and even in the middle of defeats and things, you bring us out on the other side of it. And Lord, we, we thank you for that. Be with us today, the different people of doing the different things from Sunday school teachers to the Pastor Steve preaching to us today and then also the Oasis singers be with them that the inspiration would go out into the lives of people and that we would all go home changed, filled with your glory. Thank you, Father. We ask your presence here, the Holy Spirit again, and the angels and the power of Jesus and all the things we do not see. There is many things that are out there that we really do not, uh, we actually don't have much of a concept even what it looks like. But we do know there are things out there that you have prepared for us. We know there's the Holy Spirit that is invisible around here and lives in us. And we also know there is angels. And yet they seem to be invisible for the most part. And we pray, Father, that you would just... And, and then there's principalities and powers that have not fallen. And we read about that. So we ask for your full protection and for your full glory to be here this morning that the name of Jesus would be honored and lifted up. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have some announcements this morning. Uh, there is still one announcement on, on its way up here, and I don't know uh, if you are out there printing something out. I think, oh, here it is. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mike. Just an announcement that I'd like to make. This is actually, I'll read it off. We all know that Jonas is not with us today. Not the way we understand, he is absent from us, present with the Lord. And this is from the family in Myrna, specifically. We, the Miller family, would like to extend our deepest gratitude to the Oasis family for your tender care of us during the passing of Jonas. Thank you for each, thank you for each water bottle, each plate of food, the arranging of the flowers in our time of grieving, it brought comfort. Thank you for all your prayers, love, and support in this journey of grief. From Myrna, Mike, Julie, Junior, Carrie, Elaine, Nate, Sue, Melissa, Ryan, Heather, Dustin, and Monica. Praise the Lord. I think it gave, according to what Mike had told me, it gave him a different perspective of doing those little things with excellence out there that normally you kind of do things and you kind of, yeah, we did what we needed to do. But when you're on the ministry side of things, he said it gives a total different perspective. Also, I would like to uh, just, uh, let me see at the opening announcement, children, children will be dismissed for Sunday school after worship this morning. They will be practicing for the upcoming service on December 22nd before heading to their classes today. All right. Um... Uh, Okay, also the new member orientation, we don't really know what you call that, but those of you that are new members, um, the meetings uh, taught by me will be on January 3rd, 10th, and 17th. How many of you remember that? January 3rd, 10th, and 17th. You're not asked to voluntarily be there. You're asked to attend. Okay? January 3rd, 10th, and 17th. This will be Wednesday evenings. And if we need an additional one or so, we'll do that. Um, that would be of 2024. Mark your calendars. Also, there are copies of the two articles that were read or talked about at the ladies' meeting on Tuesday evening. 
out at the desk by the library. So if you're looking for that, there are copies of that, two articles that were read. Some of you, I guess, had requested that perhaps later, and they're available. I think that is all. Um, so the children will stay in here for the morning worship until after that. They will be dismissed. I have one thing that I want to read this morning. Um, we know so little about what's going on in the world that we do not see. We know that there is things happening. We know, we know that in the underground world or behind the curtain scenes of our flesh, there's much activity, but we don't see. We know that there is angels. We know the Holy Spirit, yet we've never seen him, the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and that's found in Ephesians chapter 6. I just want to read this. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But notice this, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, it was interesting. I uh, ran across a testimony of a man um, that actually had died and he went on for, I think, maybe 45 minutes. And normally, and this was a professing Christian, he was a Baptist man, a professing Christian, and he, um, he was busy, he did a lot of things for the Lord, he was actually an assistant pastor and all that, and uh, he was involved in some government things and so forth. And when he came to dying, he saw how displeased that God really was with his life. He thought he was doing a lot of good things and so forth, but he found out that he wasn't. But then he said, and this, is, this happened already back in the, yeah, 20 some years ago, but he is now an old man and I heard his testimony. Um, very interesting. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And this is what he said that he saw. He said he went, he transitioned from his body and they pronounced him dead. And he was gone into another realm, and he said he was introduced to the powers of darkness. And I'll just say some of the things, just a few of the things that he saw. But he said, I saw the meetings that were happening in the unseen world on, with the power of darkness. He said, I saw, this is what he said, I'll repeat what he said. He said, I saw the devil, and he was sitting at a table, a big large table, and there was his prince, the prince, controlling prince that were meeting in a big meeting, and they had a world meeting where they were discussing, of course, the whole world and the strategies. And now I'll just break it down to, to a couple things, and it really made a lot of sense. And I thought, wow, if we could just look at our lives and see how difficult it has been at times and know that there were strategies and involved in this picture. This is what happened. He said, they were assigned, the, the print, these princes. We know that the devil is the, the prince of the power of the air, all right? But then he has what he called fallen angels that were, the fallen angels were sitting there, uh, quite a number of them, but they were assigned as the highest of the, they had the highest of authority. And they were given these regions. And we also know that Daniel talked about the prince of, or the uh, prince of uh, Persia. So there was, there are some examples, he brought out different examples of where the Bible actually uses these phrases, and it's interesting. But he said, this is what they did. They were strategizing against God's plan. And they looked at numerous things, and they were talking about this, and they were called them hot spots. There was a hot spot going on, and so and so. And so, they had assigned princes to those, when I say princess, I'm not talking princesses, I'm talking prince, all right, not male or female. They were assigned powers over certain areas to affect them. But then if they saw somebody that was very effective in the kingdom, they assigned even princes, a prince to that. And those prince then, which is the principalities and powers, they were giving other forms of powers, and he called them like they were like, uh, almost like the insect world, like demonic 
things, to try to set up plans of failure to those people. And he said, this is going on all the time, that they're picking somebody out, people that are most effective in the kingdom. And I'll, I could have talked about other countries, but I'll bring it down. People that are most effective in the kingdom to do a setup to get them discouraged, to get them to tumble, and to get them to shut up. It was very interesting as he saw this whole picture. And I would now just like to say this this morning in your own life. Sometimes you look at things as unfortunate things that I wish I would be different. I wish something would have, you know what I mean? There is plans that are set against you. There is a whole strategy that is set against you to make you fail, to make you discouraged, to make you quit, to make you run. And then they pile on top yet and make you feel so bad that you never ever want to stand back up again. There are strategies in plays. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against princes, yeah? And powers, demonic world, and they're all assigned they look at your lives. They want to make your life miserable. They'll pick you out and they will set up traps for you. They will try to affect you constantly. Just be aware of that. This is why we pray for the protection of God on our lives. We often pray, God protect us, but we're thinking protect us from tornadoes and from accidents on the road. No, our protection goes much greater than that. Protect us from evil, from harm and from danger. So there is, a, there is established things in the, in the realm of darkness that is set up. We read about this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Things that are set out to destroy you. How many of you understand there's probably something like that? Amen? But just remember that every day there's things put in place and if the more, the more you are, uh, the more, how should I say, the more um, effective you are, the greater the strategies. And the other thing he said, that he, he said that at that meeting that he saw, he was like, he was there and he wanted to get out and he couldn't. He said that when somebody, if, when the devil ordered certain things and they were saying, well, almost like what we would say, shorthanded in staff, you could just ask for a whole bunch of demons to attack against someone that week and ask for those demons. These princes were given this demonic world to really put pressure on people. Think of that. Now I like to say that David said that he was formed in iniquity. Even iniquity in the way he was formed was already in his DNA. We understand from the understanding from Adam. But David said he was formed in that. Now I'd just like to remind you of this this morning, that perhaps in your childhood, as you were growing up, there were already things that were forming in you to bring you against God, or to bring you so that you do not find God, or to make God ineffective in your life. And it could be through little things that you pick out in your own life that you're not satisfied with. This could all be a strategy of Satan. We know that Jeremiah was ordained to be a prophet before he was born. And there is certainly some of you in here that have had a call on your life before you were born. And it might be one of those things that you find as a flaw in your life, in your character. This we bring to God and we ask him for healing and wholeness. And the other thing is, I want to just say in, in my last word, I was not planning on speaking that long, but as I, yeah, this is, this is what I'm saying to you. How do we overcome this? Number one, what is the Holy Spirit saying? You might have discouraging things in your life that are attacking you on a daily basis, ways of discouragement, situations, circumstances. The devil sets these things up. But what is it that you're listening to? Are you listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling you or what the devil is telling you? And this is our victory. 
People, as you grow older and as you go through time and history, you will at some point, if you will have to at some point, credit all your victories by the Holy Spirit. That you will have to conclude that I could never have done this, never have made it without the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how real the Holy Spirit needs to be in your life and in my life. God bless you.
King, go and tying in what we heard this morning a little bit. The, there is an enemy that is seeking to destroy, and we see that manifest even today, physically in Israel. There's, um, I know there's people that this is a divisive subject in the world. What do we do with the Jewish people? Do we support them? Don't we? You know, they reject Messiah and all that good stuff. And you see. The perspective the New Testament gives us, and Paul in particular, is he would, he would have forsaken his own salvation if it could have been at that time that the Jewish people would have accepted Messiah. And that is the heart of God. That's ultimately why Jesus gave his life. The Bible does say that salvation is to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. And so we are participants in their plan that God has for them. And I know some people say that's controversial. It's scriptural. Unfortunately, throughout the millennia, there's been a lot of redefinition, a lot of things built up around concepts of us replacing and all of that good stuff. But in the middle of this, think about this. Why is the world so against Jewish people? Why? What have they done? They're exceptional. Okay, they are in, in many times, uh, many, many places in places of power and government and finance and things like that. But is that a conspiracy or is that God's blessing? You see, God's ways are not our ways. And even though we can say, well, we believe in Jesus, I think it's fair to say the church has sin in its own camp. And who are we to point fingers at God's plans? At the end of the day, Paul makes the statement that all Israel will be saved. And he's not talking spiritual Israel. He's talking Israel. I don't know what that means. But he said it. And he said it and he meant it. And there's context. Now, why do I say all this? Because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. There is an enemy who is seeking to kill, to destroy, to end, to finish God's promise on the earth. And if he can do it to them, he can do it to us. And so we need to pray that God would intervene on behalf of his promises, behalf of his people, because it is part of his plan. You say, well, the church has replaced it. Well, all I can say is the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. The what has been replaced is what? If you point to it, Jesus was Jewish. He came to Jerusalem. He came to Israel, to his people. And there's not a new Israel. There is always been one, and that is the children of God. And we, according to Ephesians, are made one in Messiah with them. So what is Israel? It is Messiah's body. And it's not new Okay, but it's expanded. So there's a commonwealth that Ephesians, Ephesians says. And so by faith, we join the commonwealth. By, by the faith that Abraham showed out in his people, we join the commonwealth. And yes, not everyone is of Israel, okay, is of Israel. There are those who have to practice. They have to, but that doesn't mean we hate them. That doesn't mean we turn our back on them. That doesn't mean that we despise them thousands of years of blood on Christian hands because we hate who God loved. And Paul explains this. Look, according to the gospel of the enemy, but on behalf of the Father, they're loved. It's one of the things that God had to deal with in my heart against this whole issue back decade plus ago is that my God, you love these people. It's not because they're physically worthy. And he says that even in Moses' day. They're stiff-necked people. They're stubborn. But he chose them. 
And in that context is where Paul says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. He didn't undo his promise. And so brothers and sisters today, part of our plan, if you want to see what the enemy is trying to do right now, is destroy Israel. And yes, they are worthy of judgment just as all of us are worthy of judgment. We are worthy of judgment probably even more. Even more. But this morning, God is looking for people to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to pray for the salvation. First, the Jew, but also the Greek. Those are New Testament concepts, brothers and sisters. This is not Old Testament stuff. This is New Testament. And why do I say it this strongly? Because I see what the people either in their support or not support, I see that it, people want to shy away from it. So I don't, I don't There's part of us that wants to be like, and I say, sorry to use a, a word that we know in Dutch, and that's satch. It's kind of like, see, I told you so. That God is judging them. It's not how it works, brothers and sisters. We are to pray. Jesus gave his life for people that rejected. The high priest that rejected. He gave his life for them. And the disciples followed. All right, harsh rebuke. But why do I say this? Because this is part of this purification that God promised through Zechariah the prophet. He said that his people would pass through the fire. Isaiah says the same thing. The prophet spoke of a time, a coming pressure that, that his people will walk through and they will come out the other side refined. And in Zechariah 14, you know, there's the promise of this new Jerusalem. And at the end of the day, like in Zechariah 12, they will look upon the one whom they've pierced and they will weep. There is coming day of reckoning. They will see Messiah. They will see him with tears in their eyes, but we can't throw swords at a plan that is not yet finished. And instead of trying to wrestle away what God is wanting to do in general for ourselves, let's join the plan and be one of the few that stands on God's side and prays for God's work to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Most people are far more concerned about their own kingdom and they are about his kingdom. His kingdom come. Father, what is your will in this? Father, why have you allowed this? Father, please bring peace again. And not war. Amen. Amen. The Lord will come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes, he is high and lifted up. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He comes in power, strength, and might. Blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord, He comes, He's high and lifted up. Blessed is He who comes, in the name of the Lord, Here He comes, in power, strength, and might.
Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning and to be here together with saints to worship Jesus. Just good to be here this morning. Uh, Children, I'm going to dismiss you, but uh, can I have your attention first, please? Okay. You are all going to go this direction and go over to the gathering room this morning rather than to your Sunday school rooms, okay? So children, you're dismissed and go this direction and go over to the gathering room and then you're going to practice some songs there and uh, then you'll go to Sunday school from there, okay? All right. Very good. Do you ever wish you were a child? You could start over. Jesus has given us a new life. Old things are passed away. And we have started over in him. All right. Would you stand with me, please, this morning? I'd like to pray. Father, this morning I'm glad that we have an open heaven and it's because of the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, your word says that we can come with boldness to the throne of God by the blood of Jesus with a heart that's been washed clean from guilt and shame. We can come with an open face beholding you. What a privilege, Father, that we have in this new covenant that was not afforded to most people in the old covenant. So, Lord, I bless you this morning for this privilege. I thank you, Father, that you're not far away. In fact, Romans says that you're as close as the word on our mouth, on our tongue. We don't have to go to heaven and bring you down. You've already come. We don't have to go down to hell and bring you up. And where would we go away from your presence? You are everywhere. Our minds find this hard to understand. And yet it is the reality of who you are your spirit, and we worship you. And Jesus, you said that the Father is seeking people to worship him. We worship We receive you. Lord, I thank you and praise you for the way that you've made, for Jesus, for the Holy Spirit, for your comfort, for your guidance, for fellow believers, for people that we can walk with, that we're not alone in this world, for all the good things you've given to us. Lord, I bless you today, and I bless you for your word. I ask today, Father, that for the help of the Holy Spirit, as I minister the word that you've laid on my heart, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message today is Keeping the Garden. Keeping the Garden. And Brother Arlen has done such a wonderful job in putting a picture together for us today. I'm not sure where these pictures come from, but they remind me of a place in Vancouver, um, Vancouver, Canada, place called Butchard Garden. Some of you have probably been there. I know Brother Wayne and Sister Martha have been there, and I'm sure some of the rest of you have too. I like places like this, places where you can walk and you can see that somebody put some work and some effort and some thought into that. And I like those kinds of places. Keeping the garden. You know, um, I think... I know, I guess we'll start this way, that um, we all have had breakthroughs in our lives, I think most of us in here, if not all of us in here, we've had breakthroughs in our lives. And we found the, we found the Lord and he's found us. And we have times that we look forward to, times like conferences, when the Lord moves on us in special ways. I like those times. 
And we are often looking for these places in life where great things happen, where big things happen, and they do happen. But my message today is about the times that we live between those breakthroughs. And a bit of a exhortation about how the Lord expects us to walk and how to live. Now, if I had it my way, I would want to live all the time on some of those mountaintop and mountain peak experiences. I love those times. I love those times like what Peter and I think it was John, I'm sure who the other one was, with Jesus up there on the, on the top of the mountain. And there they, Jesus was transfigured. What a spiritual experience. What a wonderful time. And there they were, right there, and they saw Moses, they saw Abraham, they saw, they saw Elijah and Moses. I don't think Abraham was there, Elijah and Moses, and there they were. Can you imagine? That's, Peter said, let's build something here, let's build a temple, let's, let's, let's stay here. Let's just be in this experience. And no, and then God spoke from heaven and he said, this is my beloved son. You listen to him. And then they went back down off that mountain, Jesus and the disciples, and they met a demon-possessed man down in the valley, and Jesus cast the devil out of him. So we here at this time, present time, our Christian lives, and this is one of the things I want to establish, our Christian lives are not a life where you can put it on autopilot, and from there on it's just easy peasy, lemon squeezy the whole way. It's not that way. I thought it was when I started out, to be quite honest with you. And some of my early struggles were, why am I facing this? Why am I facing that? I've alluded to that before. I want to read a verse to begin with here out of Genesis chapter 2. And I had actually preached a message somewhat about this a couple, I don't know, maybe a month ago. But I'm going to read out of Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. If we would go back to chapter 1, we see where the Lord God made man, and he made him in his own image, in his own likeness. Now, chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Just going to stop with that one verse. All the way back, God made man. He made him male and female, it says. And he made him in his image, in his likeness. Later on at the end of the, of the uh, message, I want to get into the word image. He made him in his image. We are made. All mankind is made. In the image and in the likeness of God. And I want you to think about that. Because we go around in this world and we see a lot of depravity and a lot of wickedness and a lot of sin. But every human being that you meet has been formed in the original intent of the way that we're created, body, soul, and spirit, spirit, soul, and body, in the image of God. And when you see people that are wrong, never forget that in them is the capacity to carry the image of God. And along with that, I will say, because of that, there is a respect that we give to people, even when they're wrong. Because they're made in that image. Now, I know we're fallen from that as mankind. We've fallen away from His glory. But the capacity of every human being is yet to carry the image of God. And on that foundation, we have respect. And this is, what I believe, one of the reasons it says in the New Testament, where we're instructed to pray for those who are in authority. In fact, it says that honor all men.
Honor all men, all mankind. We're all made in that image. The Lord God took the man and he put him in a garden. And he gave him a responsibility. And I like to think about this. I want to just dwell on this a little bit because I see that God didn't just put man, didn't just, he first made the garden. He made the garden and then he took man and he made man and he put them there and he said, you have purpose here. And your purpose is two things. You are to dress it and keep it. Those two things. Those are two different things. And I'll elaborate on that just a little bit. To dress means to keep. It means to cultivate. It means to help grow. It means to refine. It means to bring to a full potential. To keep it is to guard it. When we keep something, we guard it from harm, from danger, from intrusion. So we have these two words here that God instructed mankind and he said, this is your responsibility. Refine it, cultivate it, make it a place that has order, cut back when it wants to grow too much. And this is quite something. This is before sin came into the world. And man had a task or man had a responsibility. Responsibility doesn't come from the fall of man. God made us to be here and to carry out his purposes and his plan. And I'll get to that towards the end of the, the, the message of part of what that is. The word keep, the root word is a, root, a Hebrew word called shamar, which means to rever or to hold in high regard that this is a precious thing. That was the task or that was the responsibility of man. Now the word garden means, Garden of Eden specifically, means, the word garden means a fenced place or a hedged place or a place that is surrounded. That's the word garden. But then the word Eden means a place of pleasure. So the Garden of Eden that God made there for mankind was a place for pleasure. And I believe it was, first of all, a place of God's pleasure. Because later on, if we would jump over to chapter 3, we'd see that God came walking in the cool of the day, through the garden, enjoying the things that he had made, and looking for what? Communion and relationship with the man that he put there who was to take care of the garden. Where he could walk and talk with his creation. Where they could enjoy together the beauty of his creation. Where they could commune and talk. So the word garden we're not talking about a vegetable garden where you plant the peas and the potatoes. But a place that is kept. A place that is ordered. A place that is pleasant to walk through. A place where there's flowers and beautiful smells. And yes, also fruit that you can take and you can eat. There is trees in the garden of, that brought forth fruit. It's a place of God's pleasure where God wants to walk and talk and share the beauty of his being and his creation with the man that he has made, with mankind. Understand that means, of course, men and women, but mankind. I believe that was a physical place on earth. But today I want to also say I believe that this is, there's another garden that God wants to walk in now. We're going to talk about a spiritual garden where he wants to walk and he wants to talk, and where we share in his delight and in his pleasure. And we have a responsibility there to dress and to keep. 
This, uh, this has really impacted my life. It really has. Some of the things that I'm going to say today, and it's not, I've, some of them I've mentioned before in a message, but it has really impacted my life. And how that I, how that I walk, and how that I talk, and how that I carry myself, and what I do, and what I put my hand to. It's, com- it's given me a freedom, in a, in a sense. And I, and I just want to share that with you. The, I see that the, resp- that the first responsibility of mankind, and God has never in any place that I can find in the Word of God where he said, that's not your responsibility anymore. I don't see that anywhere. Now maybe the form of it has changed, but that is still the responsibility of mankind. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and everything that dwells therein, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And one of the ways that it's changed my life, that I believe that my responsibility as a child of God is that everywhere I go, I bear his image. Because by the coming of Jesus, by his death and his resurrection, there is now a new creation has been birthed in us through the Spirit where we are again restored and capable to bear the image of God. And this is the call and the duty of every man. And I'll get into some of the reasons why later. And so now I see that where I walk and where I, where I go, my responsibility is to bear that image and to honor God with everything that I do. And where I go, that when I leave, There's something of a smell that is left or something that is better in somebody's life or somehow something that there's an essence that remains wherever I go, even down to simple things about how I build something. That's a physical thing, but I somehow the Lord has established this in my heart uh, where it's for Him. Everything we do. And everything that we do ought to reflect his work, his word, and his power within us. This is what excellence is about. Excellence isn't about expensive clothes. It's not about expensive cars. It's about carrying the image of God and he is excellent. He's the most excellent being. It's almost even a dishonor even to say that. He is the most highest, holiest, purest, absolute light. And I have the responsibility to carry his image. My God! And where his image is, I tell you, it is not dark, it is not gloomy, it is not unkept, but it's full of light. That's our responsibility. This is what will draw people to God. Us bearing his image wherever we go the people you rub shoulders with. Do they smell a different smell on you? A different attitude than the world? I want to read now out of Hebrews chapter 2. Starting on verse 1, 1 through through 3. Therefore we ought to give, what? More earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. 
I'm going to read one other verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Paul talked to Timothy, a young minister, and he said, Timothy, don't neglect the gift that is in thee, which was given to thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the Presbytery. So I want to talk about neglect, because we know, as I've already established, that we have a responsibility as mankind, and we were given a task to dress and to keep. But I want to talk about neglect. Because the Bible speaks about neglect, and it says here in Hebrews that it would be possible to neglect our salvation, which was spoken of in the time past by prophets, by angels. Angels, uh, if a word spoke by angels was steadfast, we have heard this from the Lord himself. And then Paul talked to Timothy and said, now there's a gift that has been put in you. Don't neglect that. You see, the thing about neglect is this. It takes no effort. I don't know that there's ever been a man that set out to say, you know what, I'm going to really put into a lot of effort in neglecting my health. Or neglecting my wife. Or my business. I don't know that there's ever been a man who said that or a woman who said that. That's the thing about neglect. It takes no effort. That's what neglect is, is no effort. And there is this idea that somehow the Christian life, like I said in the beginning, is easy peasy and we just float along. That's not the reality. It's not the responsibility. You can be given a gift and you can diminish it by neglect. Salvation is a gift. It is a gift of God given to mankind through Jesus Christ. We become born again. But it can be neglected. And if it's neglected, and if it's not watered, and if it's not fed, and if it's not cultivated, it can wither. It can come to the place where there's no fruit coming from it. We can have a spiritual gift in our life, and we see some people that they, they cultivate it. We see the singers up here, and we see them singing. They're good at it. They have a gift for it. And yet every Thursday night they come up here and they cultivate it. They pull out things that take away from it. They don't neglect it. And because of it, you and I, we sit here and we stand here and we worship God because somebody is cultivating their gift. And we have the idea that somehow if a gift comes, there's nothing more that we need to do. That's not true. It needs to be refined. It needs to be brought to maturity. It needs to be brought to fullness. And it's no different with the gift of salvation that has been put into your life and into my life. You can neglect it. And you'll see the effects of it by lack of fruit or withered fruit. It's a reality. It's what the Bible speaks about. It can be damaged by misuse, a gift. But it can also be refined and exercised. And as it's exercised, it begins to grow into its full potential. And so, if the, first of all, the gift of salvation we experience. And then secondly, spiritual gifts the Lord puts in our life. Never be embarrassed to exercise your gift if it's not as refined as someone else's or as large because that's how it becomes exercised. By use. But if we hide them and we tuck them down because I'm not a good at it, I'm not this or that, 
then they don't grow. That's what the parable of the talents was about. The one said, I've got to keep hold of mine. I'll hide it. I don't want to lose it. When you do that, you lose it. When you are vulnerable and you use your gift and your gifts, they grow. Neglect. The word itself comes from the Hebrew alphabet, the word alpha, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alpha, alphabet. Alpha or Aleph. And that, that means first. To be of first interest. That's where the word, the root word of neglect comes from. So how does that tie together? It's simply this. When we don't neglect something, we are putting it in first place of high priority. And I want to just give you an example of what neglect can do. In... Um, it was in uh, February 1st of 2003. I remember when this happened. The um, space shuttle Challenger had already been put up in space and they were coming back and they were entering the atmosphere and something happened as they entered the atmosphere and the heat shield that was supposed to keep that at, keep that. Uh, Heat from entering into the space shuttle, something happened, a tile fell off or was missing. And that space shuttle Challenger exploded as it entered into the atmosphere and completely went and disintegrated into, into a, a million pieces probably, and seven lives were lost. Now we look at that, and that was a spectacular disaster. But the beginnings of that disaster did not happen when it was entering the atmosphere. The beginnings of that disaster started before that space shuttle ever left the pad and when it did its thing in, in space, it came in. There was something that had happened previous to that that allowed this disastrous explosion to take place. There was a piece of foam there was something with the foam on one of the, one of the outside of the, of the space shuttle. And this had been brought to the attention of the engineers that there's this foam is not really the way that it ought to be. And it had been mentioned in numerous meetings and nothing had been done about it. And somehow through lack of communication, through various different things that happened, nobody ever paid more attention to it Neither the maintenance people, the engineers, the ones that were responsible, though it had been brought to their attention numerous times. And that space shuttle left. And as it left and went up with all that power of all those rockets behind it, a piece of foam left where it had been fastened and it hit one of the, the tiles that was for heat protection and knocked it off. Just a small tile. And everything was okay until it came time to come back down into the atmosphere. And there was this little spot of exposure. And it is that that caused the entire disintegration of the entire spacecraft. That came through neglect. I've had things like that happen to me. I had a lawnmower that said I neglected. I just never bothered checking the oil, changing the oil, it was even green and yellow. That didn't make any difference. And one day, I think one of my daughters was mowing the lawn and it quit running because I neglected to get, keep the oil changed and keep it checked. And it cost me quite a bit of money. I had to get it fixed. That's what neglect will do. Little things. Proverbs chapter 3. 24 verse 30, it says, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall is in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. What is that talking about? 
It's the very thing that I've been speaking to you about. What's the lesson? Proverbs is about teaching us. In fact, it says here, I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. The sluggard is a man who's lazy. Now, we don't, I don't think we have much of a problem around here being lazy as far as physically, maybe sometimes spiritually lazy. But here he saw a man who was lazy. A little more sleep, a little more, a turning over, I think it, it can wait. This can wait and that can wait. And I went past it and I saw thorns and everything that was in there. And there was a lesson that he drew from that and it is this lesson. Poverty comes. And when it comes, it comes unexpectedly and it comes like a violent armed man. You can neglect you can neglect, you can neglect, you can neglect, and everything seems to go on. And suddenly, the accumulation of neglect has its effect, and there can be a violent end. That's the lesson in Proverbs. It will come like a bandit and an armed man. Little things accumulate and add up. And there have been men of God, mighty men of God, who have allowed things to accumulate and who have not taken care of things, who have not kept the garden. And maybe practical things of life or small things of life. And somewhere along the line, suddenly you see a spectacular failure. And you wonder, where did that come from and how can it come? I tell you, they come often from little things being neglected. Simple things, I would say simple. Things like Bible reading, things like prayer, things like taking care of sin, things like unforgiveness. This is part of keeping the garden of keeping a place that is cultivated and refined so that the plants can grow, so that the wall stays strong and firm, so the enemy cannot come in. The wonderful thing of this is also that it works the other way. In uh, Zechariah, they had started building the temple and they'd made a start and they remembered the, the temple of Solomon that was so beautiful and was so large or so so so. Magnificent, I should say. And now here, that temple had been destroyed and now in Zechariah's time, they were, they were beginning to build this temple again and the people remembered their old temple and they were like, oh. And Zechariah said, remember, or he said like this, who hath despised the day of small things? Who hath despised the day of small things? This might look like a little beginning to you. See, it works the other way too faithfulness, doing the right things time and time, over and over and over again, and you might think nothing's happening, and then one day a breakthrough comes. That's how it works. It comes. The snow falls on Mount Hermon. It's up there. The water's up there. And maybe you think, well, I keep praying. I keep asking. That's what the lady did with the judge. She kept going back and back and back. And you think, well, is anything happening? Yes, something is happening. Spiritual fiber is being built in your life. And maybe you're in a situation, you know, will this ever change? These are things that Abraham went through, or Abram at that time. And he continued. And he continued. And each one of those actions you take, each one of those steps you take, as you do it in faith, this is the good side of this. It also has that where suddenly the weight of it accumulates and you have a breakthrough or you have an answer to prayer or you see something happen that your heart's been longing for or you see a change in your life or you see a deliverance. 
I can look back to times like that. And I also look forward to times like that. And then there's the times you just put one foot ahead of each other and you keep going. And you know what God has called you to. But my message today is about not neglecting your salvation or your gift. Big failures begin with little things left uncared for. That's how they begin. Little things neglected. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, Jesus talked about the parable of the sower. And he talked about different kinds of soil. Talked about the path where the seed falls on and the devil comes and takes the, world, takes the seed away. He talked about a stony path or a stony soil rather where the seed fell and it couldn't get any roots. But he also talked about the seed falling among thorny ground. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those gospels speak about this. I'll read this verse here out of Matthew chapter 13. He that received the seed among thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, it chokes out the word and it becomes unfruitful. There's a plant that grows, but it's among thorns. It's sharing space with things. Thorns and weeds and whatever else might be there. And those all take nutrients away from the plant that is growing there. And in the end, in another one of the Gospels, it says the, it never comes to perfection. It never comes to fullness. It never comes to the intended purpose of that plant. But then it goes on and it talks about good soil where that's not there. But it refers to here as the thorns and the briars being a couple things cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches or the desire for riches. That those two things are things that we need to pay attention to. That just cares of the world. And as I studied this, I was like, Lord, what are cares of the world? They're things we care about. You know, you look at that and think, well, what's wrong with that? I care about things. I care about a business that I have. I do. I care about it. I care about my family. I care about my children and grandchildren. I care about things. And sometimes the things that we, we, we carry burdens. And yet it is these things that somehow, or cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, putting that first in your life for you, that's what you pursue above everything else. These are things that will come in and it'll choke and shut off the life of the plant if they are not dealt with. Cares, I want to talk specifically about cares the word care itself here, looking it up in the Strong's, it means to distract or divide. To distract or divide. And we all face this. There's all things, every one of you has things that you care about. Things that affect your life. But how we deal with them and what we do with them will depend on the effect that it will have on our life. And I'm so glad there's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Two verses that say like this. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Then it says, casting all your care on him. For he cares for you. As much as you and I care about the things in our life, this is a wonderful verse. As much as you and I care about our jobs, our careers, the things that we have, things that we don't want to lose, our children, 
Our husbands and wives, I care about them. And I'm responsible for them. But the Bible instructs me here that I am to cast my care on the Lord. Because He cares for me. He cares for you, Shannon. He cares. Adam, he cares for you. That's his, his, he, he, he has care for you. And every one of you. And you can think of the things, I think especially of children and grandchildren. I, the, my, my desire is for them to, to blossom and to grow in God's kingdom. For them to prosper in their life. That's what I want for them. And any of you that, as the heart of a father or a mother, you know that. That's your heart. And you do almost anything for them if you can help them. So God cares for us. But he says we have to cast our care on him. Ellis, I'm going to ask you to come up here. That's a surprise, I know. And I want you to stand here. I picked you, Ellis, because you're big and strong. Now this, I'm going to, I think this is loose. Yes, it is. Oh, this is a, this is something I care about. I care about this a lot. This, this is one of my cares. And I carry it around and it's heavy. And suddenly others pile on top of it and it becomes really heavy. What am I going to do? Alice, hold this. Oh, thank you for carrying my, my care. Thank you, Alice. You're big and strong. You can just carry that the rest of the day now. Take it back. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I cast it onto him. Now, I didn't throw it at him. He probably wouldn't have appreciated that. You can, go, you can sit down, Alice. The Lord wants us to take our care and put it into his hands. And sometimes we do that day by day by day. That doesn't mean we have to forget about it. I could ask Ellis, Ellis, how's my stone doing? How's it doing? Don't, don't forget my stone. Because there's things that we're responsible for. It doesn't mean we become irresponsible. But the heavy part, Jesus said, I care more for you than you care. I believe that, he, that that's what he means. That my concern is for the goodness of your soul and everything that's about you and around you. And I know that I, at times, I carry burdens about work and I carry burdens about other things. And then suddenly I'm reminded I never gave it to the Lord and asked him, Lord, I don't know what to do. See, the Bible, and the reason I read these two verses is this. It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And then he'll exalt you in due time. And then it goes right on. And remember, the, the Bible was not divided into verses when it was written. That was put in there to make it easy to find things. Peter said, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, humble yourself under the hand of God. He'll exalt you, casting all your care on him. Why does this go with humility? Because humility says, I can't figure it out. I'm not strong enough. I'm not powerful enough. I don't know what to do. And you have to humble yourself under the hand of God and say, Lord. And sometimes we have to say, I messed up. I need you to carry my burdens. And I come to places and I'm reminded of this over and over again. I struggle with something. Maybe it's a, a sin or maybe it's a, just a problem in life. And then I'm like, you never, you never talk to God about it. Cast it on to him. Let it go. Put it into his hands. Simple things, complicated things. This is a reality to me. Because how many times that I've come up against something and I struggle with it and I mess with it and I tussle with it. And I'm like, oh, I never asked God. And this is very real to me. There have been cases of very simple things that I, I just needed, a, I needed help. And I turned to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. Help me. 
And in a matter of 10 minutes, it was solved. Now, it's not always that way. But I believe the Lord wants us to come to, the, the, the Lord is our helper. He wants to help you. But sometimes we're like children who say, I could do this myself. That's why humility has to be involved. This is part of taking care of your garden. You see, if we carry too many of those things around and our hearts become heavy and we don't worship God, because the garden is about worship. The garden is about God's pleasure. The garden is about him being exalted. And this is your heart. And you have and I have a responsibility for the garden of our heart. Where God, by the way of the Holy Spirit, wants to come and he wants to walk through it. And his voice to be there. And we commune with him in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our victories. And there he wants to commune with us and to walk through our garden and there have sweet fellowship. But it is part of our responsibility to dress it and to keep it. To allow it to become refined and to keep things out that shouldn't be there. Cares. Cares of life. Now I want to turn to a verse that I just saw the other day in Psalm chapter 86. As I was, this was a verse that I just read in my morning reading of Scripture. Psalm chapter 86 and it's verse 11. It says like this. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Unite my heart, and that's what caught my attention as I was reading. Unite my heart to fear thy name. And there's a tremendous lack of the fear of God, of course, in the world and in our country, and even in the Christian church in general, I believe. But this was David's cry. He said, teach me, Lord, I will walk in your truth. And then unite my heart. And I caught my attention. It's like, why is David saying, unite my heart? Why is he saying that? And if my heart is united, I will fear your name. So before I go into that, I, I want to talk about, I want to start with Abram. Talk about Abram's history, and then I'll come back to this. Abram, later Abraham, and some of the things that I'll talk about here are not necessarily recorded in the Bible, but are in Jewish history, and some of the things are recorded in the Bible, so just keep that in mind. But before I go there, I'll read out of Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, and Joshua said unto all the people, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in the old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Norah, Nacor, and... They what? They served other gods. Abram lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, and he lived there, of course, with his father, uh, Terah. And Joshua said to the people here, and, and if, you would if we would read on down past these verses in Joshua, this is where Joshua then said, Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the context of, of this verse. He said, Abraham came out of a place where they worshipped many, many, many gods. When we were in Rome here some years ago, my wife and I and, and uh, Brother Roy and Sister Anne, we went um, to Italy and we went through Rome and we came to one place where there was a building called the Pantheon. We didn't go beside, inside it, if I remember correctly. But the Pantheon was built in Roman times. And the word Pantheon means many, many gods. And the way that it was built, I believe it was a round building, and they would have, had 12 statues of different gods in there. That was the Roman gods. 
They worshiped many, many gods. This was how it was in the time that Abram Abra grew up in uh, Ur of the Chaldees. Now the story goes like this, and again, this is the part that's not recorded in the Bible, but it is Jewish history that has been passed on down through rabbis and so on. That Abram's father, Tiro, was actually a man who made idols. And he made idols to sell. And one day that uh, Tiro said to Abram, he said, I'm going on a trip and I need you to take care of the idol shop. And so he left Abram there and Tiro went on a bit of a journey. When he came back, he went into the idol shop and all the idols were smashed down except for the biggest one. And he was holding an ax in his hand. And so Tira talked to Abram and he said, Abram, what have you done? What is this? And he said, well, he said, I was giving them the offering of food and, and they started fighting. And they were fighting, attacking each other, they destroyed each other, all except the big one. He was the last one. He had the ax and destroyed all the others and he's the only one that's left. And Tira said, now come on, Abram. You know that's not possible. Then Abram said, well, then why do you worship them? Now, that's the Jewish story. Again, that's not in the Bible, but I, it's, it is a well-established Jewish story. And it's, a, it's such a well-put illustration. And this kind of, thus evidently opened Tira's eyes. And it was after this that they leave Ur of the Chaldees and they begin to travel to a place. And God saw here a man because here was a man who said there is one God, not many gods, and I will worship him. This is part of what it means to not have a, or to have a united heart. And somehow God saw something in Abraham, or Abram as he was then called, where he said, I can work with this man. And he acknowledged for this time, this was a place where it was established that there are not many gods, but that there is one God. Jehovah is his name. And I will hear him and serve him. And God entered into a covenant with Abram and then later Abraham. And it is through him, through, through the seed of Abraham, the physical seed of Abraham, that our Savior, Jesus, came to this earth in the form of a child through the birth in a virgin because that man had faith and said, I will not serve these false gods. Now, there's more to that story. You can look it up sometime if you'd, if you'd like to. But there's many gods in the old times that were served, gods of the moon, gods of the sun, gods of the rain, gods of the lightning. And there was all these things that people attributed power to. But the cry of David was, unite my heart. Make my heart a united heart. You see where, where there's a place where there's strength comes. I've preached about this. Or strength comes when there is unity. Where there is no division. What does all does that mean? Because we're all different people. It means that when you and I are all tuned to the same note, there's beauty and there's harmony. When they sing up here, they have their instruments, and I'm sure that they tune them together. You don't have one person playing on an off chord and another one playing on this chord, but they're all tuned to the same master note. That's unity. And out of that comes beautiful, beautiful sound. But all you have to do is take one instrument and say, well, I'm going to be my own person this morning. And it'll make everything sound bad. And when you and I are all tuned to the master note of Jesus Christ, willing to put our own ideas and our own opinions and to put our own likes and dislikes on the altar or on the cross and say, Lord, I want what you want. And we tune our life to him. 
There's a beautiful sound that comes out of a church, out of a home, out of a life. This is what David was asking for. May my heart have singles of purpose in loving and serving God. Now, I want to talk about the history of Israel a little bit more. I want to talk about a man named Manasseh who was king. He was actually the son of Hezekiah. And it says, when he became king, he built altars in the house of the Lord. Whereof the Lord has said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. And he built altars for the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So what one of the, it says Manasseh was an evil king. So one of the things that he did is he allowed altars, to false gods and idols, to be built in the house of God and to be worshipped, other gods to be worshipped. Now later on in Manasseh's life, he took away the strange god and he took away the idols out of the house and the altars that he had built and he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings. But the point that I want to make here is that throughout the history of Israel, their struggle was always, or their downfall, that the other gods of the land, Baal, other ones, the moon god, that they wanted to worship those along with God. You see, I always thought that they had just abandoned God and wanted the others. But if you read carefully, they wanted to have God, and they wanted to have Baal, and they wanted to have the moon god, and they wanted to have them all around and worship them all. God says, no, I am God. I alone am God, and I'm jealous for my glory. The garden alone is mine. I will not share it with others. Israel wanted to have many gods. But Yahweh, Jehovah, says, I will not share my glory with other gods. And the other gods are not gods. Demonic forces maybe, but I don't know all about, I, I won't get into all of that. Now I want to come back to where I started in Genesis chapter. I started in chapter two. I'm going to read a verse out of chapter one. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him and male and female he created them. Image is about representation. In the communist countries or in countries that, where there's dictators, one of the things that they would do, you'll, and you'll see this, it still happens today. If you go to a country where there's a dictator, what you'll see is every once in a while you'll see a statue of the dictator. And it's established in different places around the country, or maybe there's a picture of him hanging on a wall, and, and, and everywhere you go you see an image of the dictator. Why? It is a reminder of who is in charge. It's a representation of the man in charge. And it can bring intimidation. If it's a man that rules by fear, they're always reminded that man is there. God established very well in his word in the law, and he said, don't you ever make a graven image of what you think I am like. Don't make a graven image of what you think God is like or of a, of a man or of an animal. Why does God say that we should not make an image of him? Because we are his image. We are his representation. We carry the image of Christ. This is what we're called to. 
And when those communist countries fell, one of the first things that they do is they go and they topple the images. They tear them down. Because there's a new ruler in place. Because there's a new ruler in place. God made us in his image and we represent his kingdom wherever we go. And part of our task is to bring light and truth where there's false images and false representations. And sometimes there's idols in our own heart. This is part of keeping the garden. This is part of refinement. If the worship team would come up, I'm about ready to close. Is allowing and asking God to show us conditions of our own garden, of anything that wants to exalt itself higher than God himself. This is what worship is about. Where there's allegiance and honor and reverence to God and to his word and to his kingdom and everything else it's below that. You see, what the world wants is they want to say, yes, we believe in God, but he is just one God among their many gods. They want to name his name. But not sacrifice to him. Not obey him. That's not how it works. God is alone God. Now there's times when things, the Lord begins to show us things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your might. This message came out of back when we had the conference And I was so moved by the messages the, the brothers from Ireland brought us. And I was convicted. I was convicted. And I had asked God for conviction before the conference. I said, Lord, bring us conviction. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit and is precious. Conviction is when the presence of God comes and we sense his holiness, his perfectness. And we see our own condition. It's the mercy of God when he convicts us. So that we can put things right. So that we can take things that have entered into the garden that shouldn't be there. And we can put them out. So that weeds can be pulled up. And I'd ask God for conviction. And I remember being convicted. And it was simply of this. Of allowing my passion for Christ to die down. Of wanting to take it easy. Of wanting to come to a place where can I just sit back and relax? And I was convicted of it. And I repented. In Revelation, there was a message to the church of Ephesus. And there was a list of good things that were listed that the church of Ephesus had done. He said, I know your works, I know your labor and your patience, and how thou oh, canst not bear them which are evil. You've borne, you've had patience. But then in verse 4, he says, But, he said, nevertheless, I have something against you. Because thou hast left thy first love. And I've meditated on that. And I used to think, I used to think that that verse was referring to when I first came to know the Lord, 
that I had a hot, burning, passionate fire. And maybe it is partly that. And I always thought of it as the first love that I had. But no, I believe it is this. That I, I believe it is primarily this. Who is my first love? It's Christ. I'm married to my wife, Ellen, for 40 years. She's my first love. And I don't share the love that I have with her, that kind of love with anyone else. She and I have a garden that we, and I, that we walk in. And we don't share that. We have intimate times of communion that I don't share with anyone else. She has a place in my heart that no one else has, as it rightfully ought to be. And so we're here where the message is to the church of Ephesus, you've left your first love. I believe it simply means that they no longer put Christ first in everything. And allowed other loves to come in, to share. So I want to talk about the garden of our heart, where Jesus comes to commune with us through the Holy Spirit. We are responsible. There's things that need to be taken care of through the course of life, through disappointments, through being let down, through failures of our own, through cares that we carry. But God has given us a wonderful way. One of them is repentance, confession. We can take care of things so that that relationship is free and open. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to take care of our garden, to be a representation of the glory of God. So we're going to worship here at the end, and if you have something that you need to lay at the altar, this altar is always open, or come forward and just worship Him. For He first loved us, so that we can love him. Let's love him with all of our heart, all of our being, all of our soul, all of our mind, with everything that we have in us. God bless you.
may be seated just for a bit. Um, thank you, Pastor Steve, for that word. You spoke so directly to my heart. I, uh, yeah, it, it couldn't have been more what I needed in the moment for right here and right now. And um, I know that, you know, the picture that we had up here of that garden is a picture not one of neglect, but there was some intentionality put into that garden. And, uh, you know, we find ourselves in seasons of almost euphoria where, where God seems to just be working in every aspect, in every prayer, sometimes down to the very day that, that you pray for something or you pray for someone, it almost seems to take in, in effect right away. And those are some, some wonderful seasons. And, uh, and then we find ourselves sometimes in seasons where that is not the case. And where you pray and nothing happens and you pray and you don't hear from God. You don't seem to see much taking place. And I call that the land in between. That's the moment in between perhaps one mountain to another. But it's in that time where, what are you going to do now? God doesn't seem to be, to be working or doing much. And so what's going to happen to your garden during that time? And it's easy, it's really easy to just start neglecting things and just starting to let things go because, well, what's the use? What, why, I, um, why even pray more because it doesn't seem to work? And so we, we begin to let down our guard and we begin to let things grow and creep in that don't belong there. But see, in, in between, it's how well we cultivate and how well we keep and how well we dress our garden determines the breakthrough that's going to come. And, and Pastor Steve mentioned um, Abraham. You know, sometimes we read these great men of God and it seems like their entire life was just filled with miracles and wondrous moves of God and and every day they must have seen some miracle, but that's really not the case. Abram spent years not really having a word from God. He was a shepherd by trade. And I think day after day, he took his sheep, he took his flocks, he watered them, he fed them, brought them back, and days turned into weeks and weeks into months and months into years that he didn't really hear from the Lord at all. But he continued to cultivate, and he continued to keep what he had. And then all of a sudden, the Lord showed up, and something great happened again in his life. And I think so much sometimes when we are, as people of faith, we go through these times where there doesn't seem to be much happening, and it becomes mundane, and it becomes rather uneventful. And it's during those times that we're vulnerable to the thorns and thistles of neglect. And they come in and they start to grow. And they, you know how it is when multiflower roses start to multiply. Boy, they will take over. And you really don't have to do anything to cultivate them. They grow all by themselves. And I've seen fields that weren't brush hogged in years. And that's what happens. They, they multiply without you having to do anything. That's just neglect. But cultivating. And so what are you going to do in between the times when you don't really hear from God? And it's tempting to, like Pastor Steve said, well, I, it's, it's, I don't hear anything. I, it's, nothing's happening. But it is. It is happening. There are things being orchestrated and put together in your life that when that breakthrough comes, see, see, people of faith can't really plan their breakthrough. You also can't really plan for the desert times in your life either. And sometimes it's, it seems like the world gets to plan and strategize and, and, wow, things just fall into place for them. And I look so foolish and they look so wise. But see, as people of faith, we can't necessarily orchestrate when that breakthrough comes. But when it does, 
it will be so profound that you know that you know that you know there was no way that you could have done that, that you could have planned that. But in the meantime, we cultivate. We stay faithful, we stay steady, and we just cultivate and we keep what the Lord has given us. Amen? So take heart and take courage wherever you're at in between. Just take courage and take heart and just continue to cultivate because there will be a breakthrough. Amen? Why don't we all stand and, and uh, have a dismissal prayer and thank you again so much, Steve, for being used of God in such a mighty way. Uh, I was really, I was deeply convicted as well and uh, the message spoke to my heart. So let's pray. Father, we bless you again this morning and thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is just like the snow on Mount Hermon, that it melts and it slowly begins to find its way down the mountain and into the valleys of our lives, into the little crooks and places that our lives are made of and they water ever so slow but so true. And life comes. Things grow because of your word. And Lord, sometimes it seems like barely anything is happening, barely anything is moving or changing, but Lord, Give us the courage to cultivate and to continue on. Lord, Abraham was not known by so much of what he did, but by how he cultivated. And sometimes, Lord, the only thing that we're required to do is to just hold on, to hang in and trust you. So we thank you for your word. Thank you for what uh, was shared today. Bless Pastor Steve as he gave of his time this whole week. and. And today, may you water his garden and bless him for the way that he has been used by you to feed us and give us courage, strengthen us as we go from here, that our lives would be a well-watered garden and that we would produce fruit for your kingdom. We bless you, we honor you, and we praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you're dismissed.